Hello. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. Um, and uh, I basically, I develop with WordPress. And I make my living uh, with WordPress. I build themes and plugins and apps and so on. And uh, my job mainly consists of then writing about what I do. And that's uh, why I ultimately end up in places like Smashing Magazine, where I'm the editor of the WordPress section, uh, WPMU, Dev, and uh, Honkyat, and all those nice little places. Um, today, I thought I'd talk to you about developing WordPress. But before everyone gets up and walks away, it's also for WordPress users. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about how the lines can be blurred between a user and a developer, and why it's great to know a little bit about development, even if you're just a user. Um, so while Neil sets up my, oh, is it ready to go? Oh, okay. Um, still. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a bit about bridging the gap between being a developer <laughs> and a user first. Uh, many people think that being a developer is kind of like a digital state of being. You're either a developer or you're not. And developers are some magical creatures that emerge somehow. Um, this is not the case. Uh, the way I started out, um, about eight years ago, I had a blog, and I really wanted my background to be read. I knew nothing about how to edit files. All I knew was how to write in Word. Um, so I spent about eight hours researching how to do this. And after a sleepless night, I managed to make my background red. And basically, it all kind of emerged from there. So there's a misconception that you need to go to school to study coding. This is not true. Anyone can start. And um, one of the main points is that it's a spectrum of being. It's not you're either a developer or not. Uh, you know, you start out simple and then you build it out. There's no problem with being a, a beginner developer, um, especially nowadays when you can use tools like Treehouse to basically just learn WordPress from the get-go. It's pretty. Uh, it's getting easier. Um, one other thing is to um, if you're just starting development, um, there are times when you want to hit yourself and throw your mouse out the window. Um, this happens to everyone. Um, it even happens when you're further along your development career. It, you know, it happens less and less, but it still happens. Everyone has been there, so don't worry about it too much. All right, so um, I'll kick off by um, um, talking about some of the things that I'm going to introduce to you. Um, I develop and I use WordPress um, with automation. Um, I try and use standardization. And I'll use loads of tools which help me to do these things. And I'll introduce you and show you some demos of some of these. Um, as I said, I tried to sh I'm going to try to show you tools um, from both the perspective of a developer and a user. So hopefully, it will be uh, interesting to both of those groups. Um, automation is mainly about working faster. Um, this enables you, do to, you, do to, uh, you to do a few things. For example, um, it allows you to access uh, complex tasks. This would be things like um, obfuscating JavaScript. If anyone wants to take a look at the jQuery website and download the minified version of jQuery, um, if you can write that you know, just from the top of your head, then you know, just go out the room right now. Um, it also allows you to simplify workflows. Um, by that, I mean uh, you might want to automate simple tasks, like, for example, deleting folders, deleting files. Whenever you want to put your work online, there are loads of things that you need to do. Um, these aren't really difficult by themselves, but you know you might have 20, 30, 40 of these tasks, and having a way to automate those is really great. Um, it also enables you to write better code. Um, one example would be JavaScript linting, for example, which doesn't just let you know when you've made a syntax error. It also shows you when you've made some bad programming choices, like forgetting to put the semicolon at the end of the sentence, uh, defining a variable, and then not using it, and things like that. Um, it allows you to create more modular code, um, for example, less or SAS, which is a superset of CSS. Um, it allows you to write um, styles much better by using functions and mix-ins and variables and so on. And of course, it allows you to work faster as well, um, not just because you can automate all that, but because uh, you can do things like text expansion and uh, use tools like Alfred, which lets, you, uh, which lets you launch apps from your computer really quickly. And it's not just for programmers out there, it's also for users. And chances are that if you use WordPress, you already use loads of things like that. Like, for example, the WTP to Twitter plugin, that allows you to, to tweet your posts automatically when you publish them. Uh, the Regenerate Images plugin is something that you may use if you change your theme. Your images may look a bit wonky because they might be shrunk or they might be blown up a bit. Um, going through all your images and regenerating them would take about two weeks if you have a lot of them but a plugin takes care of that for you. Um, administering WordPress, this is something I'm going to talk extensively about with WPCLI. 
WPCLI is something which allows you to automate tasks like um, installing WordPress, updating your plugins, even updating your plugins on multiple sites at once. Uh, so obviously, if you're just a casual user who has a website, this is great. If you're a user who manages websites for others, this is even better. And if you're a developer, this is, this is the best thing to ever happen to you. Um, you can also back up your site using automation. Um, you might have heard of VaultPress, which allows you to base, and it's one of the best um, cases of automation because it's kind of set and forget. Uh, you just give it some of your data. It will take your database. It will take your themes, your plugins. It will back up everything. And if anything goes wrong, there's a one-click um, backup. Um, it allows you as well as a user to write faster. Um, one example which people overlook sometimes is WordPress shortcodes. Um, basically, if you think about it, you type in gallery inside square brackets and then out pops a gallery. You don't need to put any images anywhere. Um, as developers and also users as well, you need to um, remember to automate as much as it makes sense to as opposed to as much as you can. Um, I've made a one-page website where I've essentially spent two hours setting up my development environment and then proceeded to make the website in 20 minutes. Um, you know, if I wouldn't have used my development environment, it would have taken me 40 minutes, but if you do the math, it was still a bad choice. Um, there is a misconception that automation is difficult. It is definitely not. There are loads of tools to help you, like Grunt and the Terminal and CodeKit and Prepros and Koala and Gulp. Um, CodeKit and Prepros and Koala, they're GUI tools, so you don't need to know any terminal stuff either. Um, CodeKit um, and Prepros is, uh, is a paid application, but Koala is free. Um, and Gulp and, uh, and Grunt are terminal applications, or at least you need to write some code. The biggest misconception of all is that the terminal is difficult. That's very small, sorry. Um, it's, it's absolutely not. For the coders out there, if you can create a website in PHP, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and maybe even MySQL, you can't tell me that you can't put in three commands into a box. Um, I know nothing about the terminal, but I basically use things that I've seen from others. So in this sense, I've kind of learned a little bit about it. It's really very easy. You just read what other people are doing, and then you do them, and you hope it works. Um, here are some of the things that I automate. Um, codes, I'll just blow through these, like CSS uh, um, snippets, sorry, code snippets, CSS and JS minification, code validation, um, concatenation, auto prefixing, website deployment, code completion, dependency management, file operations, version control, image optimization, and app specific automation. And this list could go on for about 55 slides because everyone has individual needs. Um, so, let me give you a bit of a demonstration of what I mean about automation. And, um, and let me just prepare this and exit my presentation. And if you'll allow me two seconds, I'll grab my mouse as well. All right, I'm a horrible typist, so please, I apologize for any issues I make. Oh, there we go. All right, oh, before I move on, I'll just tell you actually what I'll be showing you. Um, one of them will be Vagrant, which I haven't talked about yet. Vagrant is a server that you can install on your computer. This sounds extremely complicated, it's not. And you can use it very easily as a user as well. It allows you to basically run WordPress on your computer. Um, many people use XAMPP or LAMP or MAMP or basic flavors of AMP. Um, but Vagrant is one of the best choices, and it's really easy to get started. And as users as well, you can do it. Um, you can try uh, using it to test what you're going to do on your website, to test themes, and so on. WPCLI is something um, I was introduced to by Mike Little, one of the uh, co-founders of WordPress. And at the time, since um, I didn't like the terminal that much, I, I didn't really try it out. But uh, once I did, I got hooked on it immediately. It, as I said, it allows you to automate basically anything you do in WordPress. Um, ACF is one of my favorite plugins of all time because it kind of bridges the gap between developers and users. It's equally useful for both sides of the coin. Um, CodeKit then is an app I use to automate, uh, the one I've showed you um, is one I use to automate my coding workflow. So I'll show you these things. Let's get started. All right. <clears throat> so first of all, all you need to do is to get started with a server on your computer is basically to go to the Oracle website, VirtualBox is what you need. You go to Downloads, you download a file, and then basically you're done. You open that file and install the thing inside it. Um, then you go to the Vagrant website, which is vagrantup.com. 
you go to downloads, you download the one for your system, and basically you're done. So this gives you all the infrastructure you need to actually create um, your virtual box, basically. And all we need now is basically one command, and you're done, and you have a server. Um, so what I use usually is uh, Jeffrey Wei, um, who's a great teacher, by the way. He, um, he's created this little code here. And if you actually copy-paste this into your terminal, um, you're actually up and running with the server within minutes. Um, I'll break this down a little bit so you understand what's going on. What I'll do here is I'll copy this section because all this is doing, you don't need to uh, know what's happening, but basically it's just downloading two files. So what I'll do is I'll go to my documents folder and I'll just create a place where I want to store my website or websites as you'll see in a second. Um, so what I'll do is I'll open up the terminal and just drag this in and go to this folder inside the terminal. I'll paste this command in, and all this does, as I said, is it just pulls in two files for me, a vagrant file and an install.sh file. Now, um, one thing to understand about what we're doing here is um, when you're installing a virtual ser or a server for yourself, basically you're installing um, an operating system. So it's very similar to installing something like Windows, and, um, and using that analogy, it will be a bit more easy to understand what's going on. So when you install Windows, what you do is, during the Windows install process, you give Windows your name, um, you give it your time zone, and so on. And based on this, it installs the operating system for you. And then once you're done with that, you install the things that you use, like Evernote, 1Password, you know, um, uh, then CodeKit, and things like that. And the Vagrant file is the part which actually um, sets up your server. So in the analogy, that would be you giving Windows your username, your uh, time zone, and so on. The install.sh file is what kicks in after it's installed to install things like a MySQL server and so on. Again, you don't need to know how to, what's going on. All you need to know is to paste that command into your terminal and you can get started. So quickly what's going on here, and the reason Vagrant is so good is it's not a specific server. It uses a box, and the one I'm using here is Precise64. Um, Jeffrey Way uses it, it's good enough for me. But <laughs> what you can do is, um, for example, if you have a Media Temple server or basically any other server, you can get a box online which mimics um, or actually kind of copies what your server is online. So your configuration on your computer will be the same. Um, and the cool thing about it is, is that this can be transported really easily so the files that you need to get this done consistently for anyone else, you know, they're two files and they're like two kilobytes each. You don't need to copy the server. Um, this IP here will be just how we can reach the server on our computer. I'll just change it to something I can remember, but you don't need to change it. Um, install sh is the path of the install file, and then this var slash www will be a synced folder on our server. You'll see what this is in a second. <coughs> so this is what this file does. Um, but basically, you don't really need to know this. All you need to do is, once you're done, type vagrant up, or perhaps spell it correctly, vagrant up, <laughs> um, press enter, and you'll be up and running. Now, the reason I'm not going to do this now is it actually takes uh, 15, 20 minutes on the first go. Um, because it's, it's downloading the image file for the server, and that's like 700 megabytes, and then it needs to install the OS, which also takes a while. Uh, once you've done this once, it only takes you 20 seconds or so to actually boot the thing up. So after that, it gets a lot easier. So luckily, I've actually done this. So I have a websites folder right here, and this actually houses a server which is actually running. So if I go into this um, folder, what you'll see is the same type of setup. The only difference will be is that it has an HTML folder, which was created when I actually created the server using the vagrant up command, but other than that, I haven't modified it. So the first thing we're going to do is remember that IP we had in there. If you visit that IP, um, something's already working because we're getting a web page. And this web page actually corresponds to this index file right here. Um, so already we're up and running. If you wanted to, you could download WordPress, copy all the files into this folder, and you would be up and running. Um, and you could do everything you can in WordPress, <coughs> upload files, create um, posts, create pages, custom post types, whatever you'd like. Um, I do want to show you a few things you might want to do if you want to work with this day to day. So the first thing, you might want to not work in the HTML directory because you know, it might be a bit redundant for you and you might want to put things in this directory um, first. So this can be really easily done by um, SSHing into your server. This is a way that you usually access servers online, but you can do it offline here as well on your own computer. So all you need to do is type vagrant um, SSH. 
And this is kind of like a terminal for your server. Again, don't be really scared if you don't understand everything that's going on. It's perfectly fine. You can find all this online and you can just copy paste the things. Um, so the first thing you do is, or you can do, is you go to the var slash www directory, which you saw in the Vagrant file. And you can see that if you list out the contents, it's the same as um, what you see here inside this file on your computer. It's completely synced. So if you create a file here, it will show up here. If you create a file here, it will show up up here. Right, so um, there is one more location which you need to know about. It's called Etsy slash um, Apache 2 slash sites available. And here are all the sites that you have available. We'll create more than one site in a second. But first of all, let's list the contents. And there's a 000-default.configuration file. And this is basically what governs some of the properties of our website, or at least the server. Um, so what we can do is we can open this up and edit it. There we go, in the terminal. Um, so this is the contents of this file. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to read. The document root of this website is var slash www slash html. So you simply remove this thing from here. You save out this file. And that should immediately work or not. You might have to actually restart your server. There we go. And this will hopefully now work. There we go. So now you can see that we're in the root directory. Um, so you can see this HTML folder here. Um, now we're going to, so one of the problems is, is if you want to have multiple websites, right now you'll need to create multiple vagrant instances. So you'll need to do what I did just now a few times. This is certainly possible. There's you know, nothing to stop you from doing this, but it gets a little impractical. You know, why run a lot of virtual machines when you can get by with one? So I'll quickly show you how to, um, how to do that, and then I'll get into a bit more interesting things like installing WordPress and showing you how all that works. So um, what you'll need to do is you go into this, uh, to the same folder, and you just create um, different sites by creating dif different configuration files. So let's create um, two websites. Let's just copy that configuration file. to um, blog.com, so one will be blog, the other, whoops, there we go. the other will be a website for our shops, so be shops, there we go. All right, so um, let's see how this actually looks, vi and blog.com, so let's set up our blog. Now what we want to do is um, make sure that this lives in a separate directory, so we can manage it easily. Let's give it the directory of blog. We'll need to create that, I'll do that in a second. Now one more thing that you might want to do, instead of referring to your website as 192.169.99.99, um, you might want to actually give it a proper name, like blog.local for example. This is completely up to you what you want to name it. Um, and you can do this by changing the server name. Okay, people who can actually use Vim can do this much faster than I can, so sorry about that. There we go. And once this is done, you save this out. All right, let's do the same for shops before we move on, just to set that up as well. So what we need to do here is go down here and make the server name shops.local. Also, this is, this is completely up to you, so if you want, you can make this google.com, and you can make google.com load from your own computer if you want to. Of course, it will have nothing to do with the actual Google.com. Right, so once this is done, you need to do one more thing and then restart your server. You need to enable these sites. And you need to do that by sudo a2 end site blog and shops. Again, the reason I know how to do this is that I read it online. It's not something I was born with. So if you, um, if you just look at the documentation, this is actually pretty simple. The last thing uh, that remains is to restart the server, and uh, one more thing, sorry, I was lying. Restart. There we go. And the last thing we need to do is to let our host file know what's happening. And the reason for this is that, uh, remember I mentioned that you can actually do this to load google.com on your own computer. Now, when you type google.com into your browser, your computer doesn't know that you want to load it from you know, a local source, it looks on the internet for it. So we need to tell it not to look on the internet for it. So what we do is we open our host file, which is etsy slash hosts. 
<laughs> and we add an entry here. And the entry is pretty easy to add. All you need to do is type the um, the server, uh, the IP address, and then you type the name of the site afterwards. Actually, you the whole thing. So it's 192.168.99.99 and shops.local. There we go. So if we say, oh goodness. I will quit and do that again because I have no idea what's going on. This, this has happened to me while I tried it at home and I'm still not sure what's going on. So, sorry about that. I'm going to be more careful now. There we go. All right. So um, now we can restart our server. Actually, you don't even need to restart your server for this. And if I was successful, I should be able to go to blog.local, and then the same thing will load, or else, or it might not. All right. So let's see what we did wrong. The first thing you'll need to check is just to go back and look at your configuration file, or you may need to just load it again because it might need to kick in. All right, so let's open this up again. Let's see what I did. Blog.local is the server name. Blog, this looks fine to me. So let's. Yep. Can you create the The local folders. Oh, yes. Thank you. I just, I just forgot the actual thing that you need to do to make it work. Yeah, so I actually need to create the folder here. I would have spent 10 minutes on that. So, um, <coughs> shops, there we go. This just goes to show I've done this like 100 times, I still get it wrong all the time. Um, so now it's working, there's nothing inside this right now, but if you actually copy paste this index file into the blog folder, you should see it pop up just the same. There we go. Um, so now, um, this is a nice segue into WPCLI. Um, now it's time to set up WordPress. Now, what you could do is you could go to wordpress.org and download it and then um, extract your files. That would be just fine. But we're going to use WPCLI anyway because it's awesome. So the, what you'll need to do is um, you, uh, you go to your, say here, blog. So you go to the blog folder that you have and you can see that we have that index file. Let's just remove that for now. Um, at home, if you don't have WPCLI installed, you go to WPCLI.org and you uh, follow the instructions here. It's basically a matter of copy-pasting a few commands. <laughs> You're going to be downloading a file and moving it to a different location, basically. Um, once you have it installed, you have all these cool commands at your disposal, which you can just look up here in the command section. Um, so what we're going to do now is WP core download, and that's it. And this will download the WordPress files for us. I've done this previously, so it's using a cached version, but it's going to use the most recent version that it can find. So if you look into this blog folder, it's already being downloaded. This is surely faster than going on the website, extracting it, and putting it into its own folder, and so on. Um, so now that the website is, or actually the files are installed, what you usually do after that is you go to the config file and give it all the options, like for example, where it can reach your database, and so on. So let's do that now. And um, I forget everything, so what I usually do is I just go to core, uh, config, and this shows me all the options here that I need that I need to give it, and all the options that I can give it. So let me do this right quick. WP core config. You write your DB name, which will be um, blog. You write your DB user, which is root. You write your DB password, which is root. Um, if you're using the same method as I am, your database name, uh, sorry, your database user and password will also be root because this is something that Vagrant, uh, the installed sh file sets up for you. Um, the, the DB host is localhost. That's what it is by default. You don't need to add that. One more thing I'd like to add, this is a good security um, measure, is to change your database prefix on WordPress. And the reason is that everyone knows, every hacker knows that every table prefix is WP underscore. Um, you know, just changing that from the default is a good security measure to something like, you know, that. There's no need to make that readable at all. Okay, so um, basically what we've done now is generate a configuration file, and uh, now we need to install WordPress. The first thing we're going to do is create our database 
Um, we can do this with WPCLI. You can do it with uh, MySQL in whichever way it suits you. But with WPCLI, I think it's WPDB create. I may be wrong. There we go. The database has been created. And it's been created based on the info that I gave there and one of the lines, like three, four above. Um, now we can type WP install, or actually <coughs> core install, sorry. And by the way, this is still pretty slow. This is not how I do things. Oh, and I'll, of course, there are loads of parameters. Um, this is not how I do things. I'll show you that as well, because you can automate even this even further. So before we install WP core install, um, let's give the website a URL, which will be blog.local. Our title, which would be blog. Our admin user, which will be Daniel Pataki. And our admin password, which will be the same. This is not my password usually. There we go, hopefully that will work. All right, so once WordPress is installed, I will take it on faith that this works. So we'll take a look if it works later, but first let's do some more things. Um, let's take a look at what plugins we have installed right now. So WP plugin list. This will go and list the plugins that we have, and it should be a Kismet and Hello Dolly. Um, this reads it from your WordPress installation. Um, I won't be using any of them right now, so let's delete them. So WP plugin delete, and you can give it a list of plugins like Kismet and Hello Dolly. So those plugins will be deleted now. The next thing we might want to do is install a theme and activate it. Um, there's a really good, nice theme called Sorbet. It's made by the WordPress theme maker people. Um, so let's try and search for it. I don't know what the name is exactly, what the key is. So let's type WP theme, um, I think it's search, and sorbet. So this will search the repository in real time for all the plugins that are named sorbet or have it in their um, tags, I think. So you can see that there is indeed one called sorbet and it has the <coughs> slug of sorbet. That I could have probably guessed that. So we will go ahead and install this theme. And we'll also give it a flag activate, which will activate this theme for us. So now the theme will be downloaded from the repository live. It will use the latest version. And once it's installed, it will actually activate the theme. So uh, now let's take a look if this worked. Please, please work. Um, Blog.local. Oh, look at that. There we go. So what we've done right now is we've installed WordPress, uh, we've configured it, we've deleted plugins, and we've added our own theme. Now, if you're thinking that this was a bit slow, indeed it was. However, it's probably still faster than doing the five minute install, especially if you get the hang of things. Um, you can do it much faster, and if you don't make as many typing mistakes as I do, you can even do it even faster. Um, but I will show you a way where you can do it even faster than that. Because since we're using the terminal, we can create a bash script to automate everything we've done. And again, this sounds scary, but it's very simple. I don't know how to write bash scripts, but um, basically I just cheat and look on the internet. One thing I forgot to actually show you, I wanted to install a plugin as well because we'll be using it. Um, WP plugin install advanced custom fields. Now, the cool thing is, if, obviously, as, as users, you won't always install WordPress all the time. Developers do do that all the time, so this is really useful for us. But as users, um, this allows you to update all your plugins at once. So you type WP plugin update, um, I think all, and then all your plugins will be updated. And the cool thing about, us, um, about the WP CLI is that you can use it together with SSH to basically tunnel into all your websites online and update all your websites online and update all of their plugins that are online. All right, so uh, once we've done that, I'll show you the bash script and we'll set up the shop using it. Um, I wrote the script in advance, so it's right here. So if we place this in our shops folder, there we go, um, we can use it to, act, to, um, to automate this whole setup process. And let me just show you how this file looks like. Um, it's going to be a bit scary, but it actually, um, it actually just contains what I've been talking about so far. Um, basically, we're doing the same thing, but I've written out everything as variables above, just so we can use it easily modularly for other websites. So what we're doing is basically creating our shops. So our database name should be shops. Our user is password is root. Localhost, that's fine. Our URL will be shops.local. Our title will be shops. 
my username and password is fine as it is, email. Here are the repository plugins that I want to install. Advanced custom fields, we generate thumbnails and WordPress importer. Now, if you actually give this an, a, a URL to a, to a zip file, it can install anything outside of the repository as well. So if you have some working plugins, you can do that as well. Um, I'll give it some themes to install, finally a uh, theme to activate, and then basically all the commands that we've done so far. At the end, I'll actually delete uh, the first post, the test post. Um, so this looks okay to me, which doesn't mean it will work, but let's go back to the shops folder. There we go, and we can run this file by typing bash wp setup.sh. Now this will take a second, and, um, but it will do all the things that we've done so far. And I think it's pretty clear that this file isn't, um, isn't super difficult to make, and you can tailor it to your own workflow. Um, you can add lots of other things, like for example here, what I've done is uh, when I set up the config file, I've added a little bit of PHP using the extra PHP tag, um, and I've defined WP debug to be true. This is something that developers use a lot and developers should always use to debug their applications because it will make error messages show up and things like that. So um, right now it's at the installing the plugin stage, and we'll just need to wait a little bit more to activate the plugins, um, and I think it will be done soon. WordPress importer, there we go. Theme installed, that's almost the last thing. Switch to survey theme and trash post one. So what we should see is actually almost the same thing except we won't have a post. So it's shops.local. There we go. So basically we've just installed WordPress and done tons of other things in let's say 20 seconds. Um, the cool thing is that it doesn't really stop here. As I said, you can administer loads of websites but what you can also do is, if you know some you know, PHP and other terminal commands, you can do loads of things. You can, um, you can import a database from your online server. You can export a database. You can, you can dump your whole WordPress. And basically, the holy grail of questions is how to move my WordPress site. You can do that in about, as long as you don't have to move the media elements by hand, you can do that in about 20 seconds. It's, ex it's an extremely great way of working, especially if you're a developer. But it's great for, the, um, for general use as well. So now that we've installed um, ACF using this process, let me just jump into ACF and show you how that works because it's one of my favorite plugins. I'm not affiliated with ACF. I just love it so much. So if we go back to our blog, let me first give you a short introduction of what ACF is. Um, Advanced Custom Fields is, uh, is a plugin, and you can kind of guess that it makes custom fields. Um, and this is already available in WordPress. So if you go to your posts, and you open one, let's say you want to create a blog and you want to blog about books, for example, and you want to share your favorite books with people. What you might want to do is, um, is put in the word count of your post, of your um, pages, no, of your books, um, show people who the author is, show people where you bought the book and things like that. So what you could do is you could go into your post and start typing, this book is 200 pages long. This is fine. Um, what you can also do is go to your um, options here and set custom fields. And this will bring out the WordPress custom fields functionality. And what you would do is, you know, pages, and you would type 300. This is better and it's worse. The reason it's worse is that as a user, it's awesome that you've inputted this here, but it's not shown on your website. Um, you'll need a developer or figure out how to do it yourself to put this on your website. The, um, the reason it's better, though, is that if you can display this on the website, it's not difficult, by the way, if you can display this on the website, um, this is stored as um, you know, a bit of data, and as such, it can be filtered and so on. So basically, uh, what you can do is list all the books that you've written um, of and list them based on how long they are. Um, so this is definitely a step better, but we can do even better with advanced custom fields because one shortcoming of this is that this is basically just a text field. So if you have if you want to show uh, multiple selections, you can't put in a drop-down field right now. So um, let's go to the plugins. I forgot to activate this plugin. I can do it, but oh, never mind. So it'll be faster now. So you activate advanced custom fields. And what you get is this little um, thing in the menu here named custom fields. And this allows you to create options groups, which you can put into basically a, almost any admin page on WordPress. 
So what you would be able to do is book options and type um, page count. And you can uh, select what type of field you want. So this would be a number field. And you can add some field instructions. Um, you can make sure that it's required. You can add the default value, placeholder text, and so on. I'll just append it with pages. And that's it for this option. Um, you might also want to rate the book. If you want to rate the book, um, you might want to use a radio field or a drop down. So let's use a radio button field right now and just give it our options. And what you can do here is um, just enter, let's say you want to say that it's either awesome, it's either so-so, or it's bad. Um, you can do it like this as well, but a better way to do it, which your, um, your developer will thank you for, is writing the option as it should be stored, which is on the left side, and the options label on the right side. It's always easier not, blue, I don't know where that came from. I think I was reading the thing on the left, I think, unconsciously. <laughs> um, so it's always a good idea not to use, if you're storing values, not to use spaces, not to use dashes and so on. It's, it doesn't make things impossible, but it's just easier all around if you do it like this. Um, there we go, so that's fine. And let's say we want a more fancy field, like for example, to share where we bought the book. I'm not sure why that would be important information, but um, book store. Right, so you can make this a Google Maps field. And let's just uh, close this up. And then you can add some general options. I'm just going to make this a standard WP meta box. This, has, this just makes it look nicer a bit. Um, and here's where you select where you want to show this option group. Um, now this is really cool because what you can do is um, you want to show it when it's a post type and when the post type is equal to post. This is your general post. You can also show it on pages or you could show it on posts and only when the logged in user is an administrator. <coughs> Load. There we go, is an administrator. Um, you can also do things like load it on posts and or load it on pages, which can only be accessed by administrators. So this, is, this can get pretty complex or as complex as you want it to be. For now, we're just going to add it to posts. So once you've done this, you can go back to your post. There we go. And you can take a look at what the options were created, what options were created by scrolling down. Here we go. So now we have a page count, which only lets you enter numbers. And since it's a number field, you can use your mouse wheel to increment it up and down. You can add your rating, and you can search for your bookstore. I usually buy my books somewhere near us, which would be, which would be right here in Budapest. There we go. This is where I walk my dog here. Um, so if you update that, this, is, um, this will be saved. And um, this can be really easily used by developers later on. Now, I, I want to take a moment to stress how awesome this is, because it's not immediately obvious. So the use of ACF and plugins like ACF enables you to do four things. As a developer, it's obviously a really cool tool for automating your workflow. You don't need to worry about creating the framework which will output a Google map over there. I don't know why I'm pointing there, because you can't see it. Um, a Google map over there, or you know, making sure that the fields show up correctly. You don't need to worry about that. Um, and also, these options, group can be, options groups can be put on you know, users' web, um, users profiles as well, so you can, um, you can put people's Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff there as well. Um, so this is one thing that, um, as a developer, you don't need to do all the background stuff that comes with this. Um, as a user, it's obviously a very nice interface that you can use, and it's not just like a custom key and a text box. Um, it's much more visual, and it looks much more modular. Um, so that's a great benefit. Now, one more benefit that, or two more benefits that users and developers have is basically in communication. So the first time I used this field, I realized that basically what you can do as a developer is go to a user and ask them, is this what you want? Um, and this is actually really difficult to communicate without a tool like this. And then users, if, since uh, custom fields is pretty easy to use, they can actually go in and modify it. No, I would like you know, my map to be on top because that's the most important thing. And I would also like field X and Y as well. And it also goes both ways. So the fourth thing is, is as a user, you can, you can approach your developer and say, you know, I'm looking to implement this. Can you do it, please? And it's just, it just shortens communication so much. And, uh, and I've had really good experiences with this. It's just so much easier to communicate in this form than to actually try and communicate with, without a tool like this. Um, 
And for developers, and probably also for users, it's very, very easy to output this. So what you would do is, for example, if we view this post, right now, since we haven't implemented any code, this isn't shown anywhere. But we can actually take care of that pretty easily. So let's go into this theme. And um, this is going to be very, very bad practice, so never go into a theme and edit it. Um, always use a child theme. I'm just going to do this for brevity's sake. So if you go into the sorbet theme, I think it's the content single file which, uh, which modifies the, this uh, uh, output here. And I think it should be underneath the content. So if you write something here, it will show up on your website. Whoops, right here. So it'll be under the content. There we go. So this, let's say we want to show the page count here. All you need to do as a, as a developer or a user is just know what the key for your field is. And that is displayed in ACF. So it should be this one, page count. So you can go in here, and where do I go? There we go. And you can say the field page count. That wasn't so difficult. There we go. And if I've done that correctly, it should show 200 or 200 something. There we go. Um, also, the map data is loaded as an array. It gives you the latitude and the longitude, so it's really easy to load you know, Google Maps and just display that data. The other thing which developers and users will like is the ability to export these things. So as a user, what you can do is you've set up all your options. Um, let's say you've used this test installation to test them out, and everything looks good. So you go to export. You export your options. Uh, you just click on the groups that you want to export. Um, you export to XML. And this is a file that the WordPress importer can use. So you just go online, you go to Tools, Import, and then you import this file, and all your settings will be here. Developers can export them to PHP, where you get this little array here. And you can actually put this into your theme or your plugin. So what you can do is, let's just copy paste this. Whoops. So let's copy it into uh, the themes function file. I'll open this up from here. Also, don't do this. This is, again, bad practice. It's just quicker. Um, and if you actually come here and delete these fields, since it's now hard-coded into your theme, or, of course, your plugin, if you're using the plugin, the options will still show up, um, but they won't show up right here in the custom fields. So this is pretty good if you're creating a plugin which has its own options or a theme which has its own options. And it's also great because it allows users to use their own options while you use your own options. Right, so basically that's it for ACF. I enjoy this plugin very much. Um, I've created, um, I think, five custom um, fields for it, uh, which you can grab for free. And there are some premium fields as well. I think they cost, right now ACF 5 is out, and I think that costs $100, but you get all of them. Um, for me, it was well worth it as a developer. It has fields for galleries and, um, and repeater fields and content generation fields and so on. It's pretty good. All right, so the next thing I'll just quickly touch on, because I, let's see what the time is. Yeah, I'll just quickly touch on is um, CodeKit. Um, CodeKit is more for developers, um, and I think many developers already kind of use some automation, but let me, use, let me show you what I do. Um, I'll open up my um, a repository of a plugin I have which is, um, which should be right here, I think. Here we go. Um, I'll open this up here first. And what this uh, repository does is it's, first of all, it's a plugin for WordPress, but it is stored on GitHub. And the reason for that is just GitHub is a bit better than SVN. So this whole folder contains some data for GitHub. I upload this folder as is. Now this folder in here would be actually what you actually upload to the WordPress repository. And then this trunk folder here is what contains the actual plugin. Um, and what I do here is I have a scripts folder, for example, and this contains three scripts that I use. The scripts.js file, this concatenates these scripts, so it puts them all in one file. And the reason this is good is that if you make three requests to, uh, to three JavaScript files, that's lo a lot longer than um, requesting one file with all, the, all three scripts inside it. Um, so it concatenates them. And then, uh, basically, what you do is, I think I either have this added, yeah, I do. So um, you can see that what CodeKit does is basically it knows that you want to import these files, and it also knows where you want to, um, uh, to output them. So in this case, what I want to do is make sure that this is placed right here. So in this JS file, there's a minified version. 
And basically, what this contains is all the JavaScript code minified. So whenever I actually come here to um, edit any of these files, I save them and CodeKit automatically processes this and, um, and gives me tons of errors and, uh, and then minifies and concatenates my scripts. Now the reason it's giving me errors is that um, there are, it has detected that there are errors in this JavaScript. Um, the reason for this is, I think I also left some errors, but the reason that it has 190 something is that, for example, my, um, I use Modernizer, which just comes with errors. So what you can do, for example, and this is why CodeKit is so powerful and other um, tools as well, is you can just switch off error checking for that, just for that file. And you can go and save this file now and it will give you less errors and you can just quickly fix those. Um, so one other thing that CodeKit does really well, which I wanted to share, is create private server, kind of a server for you um, to test your work. Um, the reason this is really good is that you get a separate IP address and CodeKit takes care of all of this. This has no setup required. Um, this is automatically refreshed anytime you save a file and CodeKit compiles something. For CSS, less SAS, and those languages which give you style, it doesn't even reload it. It just shows you the changes on the page. Now this is not unheard of. The reason that this is really good is that you can type this URL into your iPhone or iPad and it will show the same view here. So you can test cross-browser right in front of you and everything gets changed by itself. You don't need to refresh the page on the iPad or iPhone either. So this is an amazingly good tool for development. So uh, those were the quick automation things I wanted to show you. So I'll just jump back into my presentation right quick and, um, and just talk to you a bit about, um, I think the next one was standardization. So standardization, I'm really keen on standardization. Um, this is more for programmers, but I think that this is, if you're looking to become a developer, this is something you should always keep in your mind because it's pretty important. Um, so standardization is the process of basically writing good code. It's a bit more complex than that. Um, and with standardization, there's a misconception that rules are meant to be broken. Um, while this may be true, I think many people miss the point of this saying because it's, it, the saying doesn't say, go ahead and do what you want. It says that learn the rules and then think about what you want to break. So you do need to learn the rules, though, before you can do that. So standardization is basically writing code that everyone understands and interprets equally. And um, as such, I would really like to under... I would just like to emphasize how equally an interprets is important, which is... I'm a horrible presentation maker because I underlined the wrong thing. Um, but the equally part is very important here. Um, this pertains to formatting. It pertains to uh, methodology, the, the way you write your code, or the type of coding you use and it also pertains to the documentation that you ship with your code. Um, before I go further, I want to say that WordPress standards are low. Try not to throw things at me, sorry about that. Um, this, this is not in itself a bad thing, and I'll tell you why. First of all, let me give you reasons for this. The reason is that WordPress uses forgiving languages. It uses HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, all these languages are really, really um, forgiving. They're really loosely typed. They're nothing like the compiled languages like C Sharp. Um, in PHP, if you don't define a variable and then use it, you know, maybe nothing will happen, who knows. Um, if error reporting is switched off and you don't make too big of an error, you know, maybe your comment count won't be shown properly, no one will ever know. Um, the other reason is the history of WordPress. WordPress was created about 10 years ago, I think it was forked from another project, and it basically used um, much more, um, like, uh, you have object-oriented programming, which is kind of a higher level, and then you have procedural code is the word I'm trying to think of. Procedural code, which is when you just write code one underneath the other. Um, it, was, it kind of started out like that, and there is object orientation going on, like the, the post class and the database class and so on, but it's still very much a procedural language, and a very good example is themes, where you don't really see objects very often. Um, and the other reason is the open community. Again, the open community is awesome. It contributes a lot more and a lot more positive things, but there are some negative things about it. The fact that it's so open means that bad code is much more easily released to the public. It means that when you, if you want to create a malicious WordPress theme which deletes all your content, you can try and do that and you can release it on your own site and it works fine. Um, you can even get by with, um, with not so great code in the repository. Um, there are checks and balances there, but you, you can still get away with it. I mean, as long as your theme works and follows some best practices, they will accept it. 
Um, the last reason is the future development direction of WordPress. There's no indication of it becoming an object-oriented, or at least a primarily object-oriented uh, framework, and it won't use um, the MVC architecture anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is in contrast to projects like Laravel, which rely heavily on the MVC architecture and heavily on object orientation. And just the fact that you use an MVC architecture and object orientation kind of forces a methodology on you, which will be the same across projects. Uh, now let me talk a bit about why this is not a problem. Uh, WordPress was built as an open project. Its ethos is to let everyone kind of share their ideas and do what they, they want easily. Now, the fact that um, PHP, HTML, CSS, JavaScript are loosely typed make the barrier to kind of, uh, you know, getting started with contributing code a lot lower, which is great because a lot more people are included in the process, whereas if you make the language object-oriented and MVC uh, focused, it's a bit more difficult because you need to know procedural code and you need to know a fair amount of standards and loads of other stuff as well. So, um, so in this sense, it's not a problem that the standards are low. And the biggest reason that it's not a problem is that just because you can contribute bad code, it doesn't mean that you have to contribute bad code. You can obviously create awesome code as well, and you should. <laughs> the, um, there is such a thing as the WordPress code standards. They dictate how you should write your code, basically. And people get into hugely hated arguments about the code standards because um, they kind of show you what dictate how you should do things, and people aren't really happy about that. Now, first of all, a misconception is that the, the code standards don't dictate what's right and wrong. They dictate what's right and wrong for WordPress. You are free to use any brace styling you want. You are free to leave off the semicolon at the end of JavaScript. Just don't do it for WordPress. Uh, they're also not up for debate, at least not in your code. Your code is not the place to you know, make a stand on your views on indentation. Um, you should use the WordPress standards and then go into the forums and then let loose there. Um, this is kind of my rule. Consistency is the most important thing when you're coding, and also when you're, you're using WordPress in general. Um, consistency should always win over almost any other concern. Obviously, there are edge cases. Um, for example, if you're writing code and you realize that you've used the, brace, the incorrect brace style halfway through, for goodness sake, don't change it. Um, use it incorrectly. Um, I would rather read code which is inconsistently um, incorrect than code which is, sorry, which is consistently incorrect than code which is inconsistently correct. Um, inconsistency can usually easily be, um, well, if it's consistently different, um, it can usually, you can go back and mass replace things and so on. It should be pretty easy. Um, also, following all the rules is difficult. Um, I said in the beginning that, um, you know, I learned coding you know, kind of by myself. And, and what I've kind of realized is that coding itself is pretty easy. It's not, you know, explaining a, a little part of what I do is not difficult. Um, explaining other parts is not difficult. Each part in itself is pretty easy. The problem lies in the fact that there are about 10 million things you need to know all at once and kind of see them in a system in order to, um, to make a proper website. And the same goes for the WordPress code standard. It's not easy keeping loads of rules in mind, especially because um, these rules, um, these rules are sometimes change how you've, you, uh, how you've done things so far. Um, the code standards will show you how to write PHP, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I'll give you a quick example of all of these. Um, this is, for example, an, uh, a PHP Yoda condition, what workers call the Yoda condition, because you don't write if the force equals true as you would logically do. You do it the other way around if true equals the force. The reason you do this is that if you forget to define the force, then you won't get a huge error. Um, it also shows spacing and indentation. For uh, HTML, you should always, always, always quote your attributes and values. Um, this especially goes for things like disabled, which people hate quoting for some reason, and it makes me angry for reasons I cannot explain. Um, you should also um, end unclosed elements with a slash, and you should have one space before the slash. I specifically hate doing this with BR tags, but there you go. Um, for CSS, you should, uh, you should write your selectors one underneath each other, and then you should use some sort of semantic grouping for your properties and your values. Um, WordPress recommends either an alphabetical uh, way of doing things, or it also recommends a specific um, way you can do it, like for display rules and positioning. Um, this just shows that WordPress isn't consistent either. I think that's why they have two rules, too. Kind of. um, with the jQuery, um, the only rule I'll show you here is that um, the, most of the JavaScript rules in WordPress, they come from the jQuery rules. 
but with WordPress, they say that you shouldn't use the jQuery each iterator to go through um, to go through general arrays. You should only use it to go through um, jQuery collections. All right, on to methodology quickly. Methodology is how you write your code, what type of constructs you use, do you use object orientation, do you use procedural code, and so on. The first one, the most important one, is to use WordPress functions. This seems like a no-brainer, but in the real world, that's not always the case. WordPress has plenty of functions. People tend sometimes not to use these functions. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, Google is your friend here. If you want to obfuscate email addresses in WordPress before you output them, there's a function called anti-spam bot, which not many people know about. So whenever you want to do something in WordPress, um, take a look at Google. There may be a function for it. And it also pertains to, um, to not doing the work that other people have done before you. So for example, if you want to add options to your theme, it's certainly possible to create a framework to do that, but isn't it much easier and more modular to do it with ACF? Also, be consistent everywhere. I think I've covered this plenty before. Um, be mindful of your surroundings. Um, this is kind of like consistency. Um, if you create something, let's say I'm going to show you in a second the plugin boilerplate for WordPress, which, has, which is a really good way of creating plugins because it puts you in a kind of fixed environment in a good way. Um, but for example, when creating plugins for ACF, Advanced Custom Fields, ACF has its own kind of template which you should use. Um, you shouldn't just spite them and use the plugin boilerplate, you could, um, but yours will be the only plugin which doesn't use the ACF template, so you should probably use the ACF template. Um, this is just a short snippet of all the things that you need to follow. Um, there are loads of APIs up there, and there are a few more, like options, settings, plugins, so on. There are loads of classes in WordPress which you might not know about, um, things like you know the WP Query class, the WP DB class, which is for database handling, and there are also, of course, template tags and, um, and functions and hooks, which you should use all the time. Uh, documentation is the last thing. Um, this is basically the art, almost, of creating proper written word documentation for your products. Um, this is almost, all, well, actually, it's always a good idea. In fact, uh, what, I've, what I've been coming up lately is that it's also better to write documentation before you actually create your product. Um, and for some reason, it helps. I'm sure other people could talk more about that, but it, it, it made my development a lot easier. So you should use inline documentation, which is the process of documenting your inline code, so if someone reads it, they know what's going on. Um, you can use PHPDoc for that, which is recommended. WordPress uses it heavily. It's a great system for documenting your code, not at least because it can generate developer documentation automatically. It just parses it out from your code. Um, you could, of course, do this by hand, but it's a bit faster. Um, there's also end-user documentation. Um, this is also actually very helpful. Developers skip this a lot because it's boring and it's monotonous, and I agree with those statements. However, it is a huge help because when you're developing something, you tend not to think with the user's head, you just think with the developer's head. And when you go through the documentation, you're forcing yourself to use your product, and you find a lot of bugs when you're doing that. And of course, it's useful for users as well, which as a developer probably <laughs> is not that important to me, sorry. <laughs> Uh, internal documentation is extremely important as well. Um, this is kind of like the developer documentation. If you work in a team, it tells people who has access to the, um, to the GitHub repository, who should upload, who shouldn't. It's all these little internal things. Um, this is an example of a doc block. Even as a WordPress user, you can kind of figure out what that function is for. It precedes the format value function. There's a description, there's some uh, meta information about it, and also there's, um, it has information about the parameters a function takes and the return value that it has. Um, so for standardization, I'll just give you a very quick tutorial or very quick show of um, the plugin boilerplate that I use. So I'll just show you through this uh, repository that I've opened. So what the plugin boilerplate is, is basically it dictates how you should write your code. Um, so it gives you this repository. Basically, um, you start out with plugin name being shown everywhere, which I've replaced with pile gallery. Um, and this is where the trunk, this is where the action really is. And it's split into three basic parts. Um, the admin section contains everything that you would put only in the admin. Like for example, if you create a custom list in the admin, you would put that there. If you create an options page, you would put that there. Um, the public facing side, 
um, shows you, uh, you put the, the front end stuff there. So for example, with Pile Gallery, um, you would put the JavaScript which makes this work, this work, um, you would put that in the, um, in the public directory. Um, and there's this includes directory which holds all your, you know, back, uh, all your common functions. Like for example, if you use, um, if you use uh, a resource which is loaded in both the front end and the back end, you would put that there. Um, the next most important thing about this plugin is that most of the important code resides in the includes um, directory in the plugin name, um, sorry, not this one, the plugin, this one, the plugin name options, no, I'm, this one, sorry, the class plugin name one. Um, here is where you basically add all your stuff. Um, the most important functions here are the load dependencies functions where you just, um, you just tell the program where all your uh, dependencies are, you load them here, and then you add all your hooks in this file, all of them, no exceptions. Um, you add the admin hooks in the define admin hooks section, and you define the public hooks here. And the only difference is you don't use add action um, directly, you use this loader add action and you put the hook here and the hooked function here, and you just refer to the pile gallery admin class here. Again, this, if you're new to object-oriented programming, this is not something you have to fully understand in order to work with it. It's very easy to learn by example, copy-paste stuff, and, um, and try and use it modularly, and I'm sure um, you'll have no problems at all. Um, so with that, I, I think I'll wrap it up, and if anyone has any questions, please do feel free to ask them right now. Let's see. I actually can't see anywhere, so if you have questions about ThemeForest or any other thing as well that you want to ask about development, then feel free to go ahead and do that. And I also have some free stuff for you guys if you don't have any questions. All right, um, then uh, there are a few things that I wanted to do if you guys are all ready. Um, I do have some free stuff for Smashing Magazine if you want, and I also have um, some deals if someone uh, wants to tweet to me, my Twitter name is here, and also follow me, and someone wants a free copy of CodeKit. Uh, the first person who does that will definitely get a free version. Um, I also have some swag from Smashing Magazine, which I can lay some of them out on the table, but I can also just throw some of them up to you guys, because I have these awesome little plush toys that they gave me. Um, if someone wants one of these, they're pretty cute. My girlfriend loves them, and so do I. Uh, oh, God. Someone has to ask me a question, then. Here you go. Oh, sorry. that my, I'll throw one up there as well. Sorry if I hit someone. Oh, this is going to be fun. I have cats as well. <laughs> you know, I'll just do it like this. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, this is fun. I should have bought more. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> nice. There we go. All right, and I have two more. I love these things. They're so cute. There's one on my desk. They're very cute. Sorry, <laughs> that might have hurt. There we go. All right, um, I also have some of these pad things. You can just run out and get them. Um, so, and um, I won't throw these because they might hurt. And uh, I also have, there's a website called these.io, it's DZO, and they're basically, whoops, um, they basically offer domain monitoring and they offer to give everyone a free account for a month. So if you want to get in touch with me via Twitter, you might have to follow me so I can get back to you um, with a direct message, but you can just unfollow me after that. Um, so if no one has any questions, I think that's the end. Thank you very much.